All right, everybody, let's go ahead and get started, shall we? Uh, welcome back to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens, and this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Um, so we've had a few weeks off. Uh, happy New Year and all of that. Um, so tonight, we're actually going to move into a new collection of suttas. So for Dharma Doors for tonight and moving forward, we are turning our attention to the middle length discourses. So this, of course, is the Majjhima Nikaya, the middle length discourses. Um, so last year, the last few months of last year, we started uh, kind of rooting around in the connected discourses of the Buddha. And that's that the really big book of not the... Not that this isn't a big book, but the really big book of the so-called connected discourses, right? The Sam, Samyutta Nikaya. Now, one of the reasons why I wanted to spend some time in that collection is because it's some of the oldest teachings of Buddhism. In fact, according to tradition, the first, second, and third teachings of the Buddha are, can be found in the Samyutta Nikaya. But those suttas that are in that collection, the Samyutta Nikaya, they're rather small. They tend to focus sort of on one singular idea. We looked at a bunch of sutras that dealt with the skandahas, with the aggregates. We looked at a bunch of sutras that dealt with the topic of the senses, the six sense bases. We looked at some sutras that were just about samsara, the cycle of kind of birth, the endless or beginningless cycle of birth, death, and rebirth. So my point is, is that I wanted to kind of spend some time in the Samyutta Nikaya to use those sutras that were just these singular teachings. Now, beginning this year, and probably for a while, we are going to look at these middle length discourses. These are, of course, a little longer. That's part of the reason why they are grouped the way they are. Um, and what we're going to basically do is we're going to take a lot of the ideas that we were looking at in the Samyutta Nikaya, and we're going to notice how they appear in these more, well, I would call them kind of more developed sutras. If you were coming to Dharma Doors last year, you might have noticed that a lot of the little suttas that we were looking at, they, they included or they were these repetitions or these like refrains of ideas. In fact, we're going to encounter one of those refrains tonight. And it was the refrain or the repet repetitive idea about the self. And this idea about thinking of the self as the same as form or thinking of the self as in form or thinking of the self as having form or thinking of self as a, like having anything to do with form. So we kind of looked at these different ways of approaching the idea of the self. But that was sort of just a tiny little sutta. But then we noticed that that refrain, the refrain about not identifying with form, not seeing self in form, not seeing itself as form, we noticed that that refrain becomes a kind of a, a stock phrase that then just gets used all the time in a bunch of different sutras. So my point is, is that these middle length discourses, we're going to see how all of those stock phrases and refrains and repetitions start to get kind of put together into these more elaborate suttas that are found in the Majjhima Nikaya. So, that's what we're going to do. 
And I think the way that I decided to approach this, and I do, I want to tell you more about why I chose the sutta that we're going to do tonight. So I decided that I'm just going to start at the beginning. <laughs> so we're going to start at sutta number one in the Majjhima Nikaya, which is called the, in, in Pali, it's something like Sabadama Mula Pariyaya or Sarva Dharma Mula Pariyaya, the discourse on the root of all things, the root of all dharmas. Sounds like a good place to start. So I wanted to do this sutta first because I figured let's just go through the Majjhima Nikaya. And, you know, I'm not saying that we're going to do every single sutta. I'll be, I'm going to be judicious about choosing which ones we focus on. But the other reason why I wanted to focus on this particular sutta is um, because this, for the next few months, I'm going to be teaching some classes. I'll, I'm gonna, I'll talk about them sort of at the end of tonight. But I'm going to be teaching some classes on my own for part of the Lotus Underground. And I'm kind of focusing on Buddhist cosmology uh, this sort of the next few months, a sort of like the nature of reality, if you will, sort of like that kind of aspect of Buddhism. So in keeping with that theme, I wanted to focus on this sutta. And this sutta might take us a few Sundays. I'm not exactly sure. But I wanted to focus on this because this is actually a really interesting presentation of basic Buddhist cosmology about like the, the universe or the cosmos, as it were. So that's kind of one of the main reasons why I wanted to focus on this one tonight is to kind of get those gears turning. But I also wanted to focus on this one because it seemed like a really good uh, connection or a connective sutta that is very related to a lot of the suttas that we were looking at last year. So one of the things that I want to mention, even because I want to do a reading of this, I want to kind of begin tonight, even though tonight has already begun, I want to begin tonight with a reading of the sutta but I do want you to know a few things before we go into it. So the reason why I chose this sutta is because it it's dealing once again with the idea of the self. Now, I mentioned that last year we looked at sutta's uh, teachings about the five aggregates, the five skandhas. And there was one major theme throughout all of those suttas that we looked at. And what it was, is it was the theme about how the noble disciple does not consider the self to be form, sensation, perception, conditioning, or consciousness, the five aggregates. But then we move to the section about the six senses. And the message was the same. The noble disciple do not, does not think of the self as being the same as the six senses in that way. And in most of the suttas that we focused on from the, uh, from the Samyutta Nikaya, they focused on this idea of no self. And tonight's sutra continues that exact same theme or that exact same teaching. So I wanted to use that as that kind of connective tissue. But then there's also going to be in kind of a, an interesting conversation for us to have later on, because we're going to encounter once again, the gods like the idea of these supernatural beings or supernatural, you know, what have you, gods in that way. And so we're going to also continue that conversation we were having last year, which is 
what is Buddhism's relationship to gods, God, the idea of a creator God, you know, just that whole world of what you would call theism versus atheism, like a tradition without gods. Well, we've noticed that Buddhism has an interesting relationship with the gods, which is that the gods come to the Buddha with questions. And that's a very profound statement right there. That the gods come to a human being who figured something out to have, and they have questions. So both of those themes, no self and Buddhism's relationship with the gods, that's going to be sort of very much a part of tonight's uh, teaching or tonight's sutra. I have two more things to mention, and then we're just going to kick back and, and listen to a nice, beautiful sutta. So the first thing that I want to mention is this. So because I don't want you to be lost, and I don't think anybody here would necessarily be lost, but just in case, this sutra, the root of all things, the Buddha is about to go, he's going to begin with the four great elements, earth, water, fire, and air. But then he's going to go to creatures of different kinds, and then even to gods, and then even to meditative states, and then even to the idea of unity versus diversity. So these, these are all the dharmas all the various possibilities of existence in a way. And what these, the Buddha is going to be saying is that the, the, the structure of this sutta is going to read like this. An untaught, ordinary person who has no regard for the Dharma, no regard for the teachings of the noble ones, when an ordinary regular person perceives earth, the earth element, as earth, having perceived the earth element as earth, they conceive of themselves as made of earth, or they conceive of themselves as being in the earth element, or they conceive of themselves as apart from the earth element, or they conceive the earth element to be mine, to be me. They delight in the earth element. And then it's gonna go on to water and fire and air and all kinds of other things. And so before I read all of that, I just want us to kind of be aware when the Buddha goes through these, I want to make it very clear to everybody listening, everybody who's kind of paying attention out there. It's not that there's a self somewhere else that isn't earth or thinks it's earth or made of earth or apart from earth. <laughs> this sutta is going to be a series of these dharmas and all from the very, very bottom, by which we mean the four great elements, all the way to the top, the refrain is going to be, nope, not that, not that, not that, not that. And I just want us to remember that in Buddhism, we are never going to get, <laughs> this is what the self really is. The teaching is that there isn't that self. So as we go through these, let's remember that that's sort of the, the, the teaching, if you will. This sutra is very long, or it can be very long. And the reason why that is, is that I'm going to read one, two, three, four pages, basically. But then those four pages of text that I'm going to read it's all, it all gets repeated 
but not from the perspective of a common world, uneducated worldling. It gets taught from a disciple that is in higher training. And then we get to the level of an arahat where the entire four pages is repeated again in a slightly different way. And then we get to the second level, third level and fourth levels of being an arhat. And then we even come to the level of a tathagata, of a Buddha. And actually even the Buddha has two sections. And in each of those sections, all four pages of text get repeated in a slightly different way. If I did all of that, it, it would probably carry us over into next week. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the first four pages. If you happen to have the Wisdom Publication Edition, there's also the uh, Sutta Central, Thank You Gnome. Gnome put a link for the, the Mula Pariyaya Sutta. That's also going to be the same translation that I'm reading here, which is the Bhikkhu Bodhi. Uh, Bhikkhu Nyanamoli and Bhikkhu Bodhi translation. Just one last point to make. Like all Buddhist suttas, these are written, uh, or like I should say like most Buddhist suttas, these are written, this is written from the sing in from the singular uh position of the bhikkhu and what that means is is that it talks about the bhikkhu perceiving himself as earth or himself not as earth and so on and so i just want to make it clear that to make the sutta more inclusive i'm just going to make it plural <laughs> Everybody that comes to Dharma Doors knows that I prefer gender neutrality. And in order to achieve gender neutrality here, I'm going to just make it plural rather than sing keeping singular. So I just want you to know that if you're reading along, you're going to notice that I'm changing things to make it uh, consistent in that way. So just wanted to make that clear. So let's kick back and let's listen to this uh, Mula Pariyaya Sutta, the root of all things. So, thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One was living in Ukkattaha, in the Subhagga Grove, at the root of a royal sala tree. There he addressed the bhikkhus thus, bhikkhus, Venerable sir, the bhikkhus replied, and the Blessed One said this, Bhikkhus, I shall teach you a discourse on the root of all things. Listen and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, Venerable sir, the bhikkhus replied, and the Blessed One said this, Hear, bhikkhus, untaught ordinary people who have no regard for noble ones and are unskilled and undisciplined in their dharma, who have no regard for true people and are unskilled and undisciplined in their dharma. They perceive the earth as the earth. Having perceived earth as earth, they conceive of themselves as earth. They conceive of themselves in earth. They conceive of themselves apart from earth. They conceive earth to be mine. They delight in earth. And why is that? Because they have not fully understood it, I say. They perceive water as water. Having perceived water as water, they conceive of themselves as water. They conceive of themselves in water. They conceive of themselves as apart from water. 
They conceive water to be mine. They delight in water. And why is that? Because they have not fully understood it, I say. They perceive fire as fire. Having perceived fire as fire, they conceive of themselves as fire. They conceive of themselves in fire. They conceive of themselves apart from fire. They conceive fire to be mine. They delight in fire. And why is that? Because they have not fully understood it, I say. They perceive air as air. Having perceived air as air, they conceive of themselves as air. They conceive of themselves in air. They conceive of themselves as apart from air. They conceive air to be mine. They delight in air. And why is that? Because they have not fully understood it, I say. They perceive bahuta beings as beings. Having perceived beings as beings, they conceive be having perceived beings as beings, they conceive beings. They conceive themselves as a being or in a being. They conceive themselves as apart from beings. They conceive beings to be mine. They delight in beings. And why is that? Because they have not fully understood it, I say. Having perceived devas, gods, as gods. Having perceived gods as gods, they conceive of the gods. They conceive of themselves in the gods. They conceive of themselves as apart from the gods. They conceive the gods to be mine. They delight in gods. And why is that? Because they have not fully understood them, I say. They perceive Pajapati as Pajapati. Having perceived Pajapati as Pajapati, they perceive or conceive Pajapati. They conceive of themselves as in Pajapati. They conceive of themselves as apart from Pajapati. They conceive Pajapati to be mine. They delight in Pajapati. And why is that? Because they have not fully understood it, I say. They perceive Brahma as Brahma. Having perceived Brahma as Brahma, they conceive of Brahma. They conceive of themselves as in Brahma. They conceive of themselves as apart from Brahma. They conceive Brahma to be mine. They delight in Brahma. And why is that? Because they have not fully understood Brahma, I say. They perceive the gods of the Abhaya Svara heaven, the heaven of streaming radiance, to be the gods of streaming radiance. Having perceived the gods of streaming radiance as the gods of streaming radiance, they conceive the gods of streaming radiance. They conceive themselves as in the gods of streaming radiance. They conceive themselves apart from the gods of streaming radiance. They conceive the gods of streaming radiance to be mine. They delight in the gods of streaming radiance. And why is that? because they have not fully understood it, I say. They perceive the Subha-Krishta gods, the refulgent glory gods, as the gods of refulgent glory. Having perceived the gods of refulgent glory as the gods of refulgent glory, they conceive the gods of refulgent glory. They conceive of themselves in the gods of refulgent glory. They conceive themselves apart 
from the gods of refulgent glory. They conceive the gods of refulgent glory to be mine. They delight in the gods of refulgent glory. And why is that? Because they have not fully understood it, I say. They perceive the gods of the Brita Pala heaven, the heaven of great fruit, as the gods of the great fruit. Having perceived the gods of the great fruit as the gods of the great fruit, they conceive the gods of the great fruit. They conceive themselves as in the gods of great fruit. They conceive themselves apart from the gods of great fruit. They conceive the gods of great fruit to be mine. They delight in the gods of great fruit. And why is that? Because they have not fully understood it, I say. They perceive the overlord as the overlord. Having perceived the overlord as the overlord, they conceive the overlord. They conceive themselves in the overlord. They conceive themselves apart from the overlord. They conceive the overlord to be mine. They delight in the overlord. And why is that? Because they have not fully understood it, I say. They perceive the base of infinite space as the base of infinite space. Having perceived the base of infinite space as the base of infinite space, they conceive themselves as the base of infinite space. They conceive themselves as in the base of infinite space. They conceive themselves apart from the base of infinite space. They can speak, conceive the base of infinite space to be mine. They delight in the base of infinite space. And why is that? Because they have not fully understood it, I say. They perceive the base of infinite consciousness as the base of infinite consciousness. Having perceived the base of infinite consciousness as the base of infinite consciousness, they conceive themselves as the base of infinite consciousness. They conceive themselves in the base of infinite consciousness. They conceive themselves as apart from the base of infinite consciousness. They conceive the base of infinite consciousness to be mine. They delight in the base of infinite consciousness. And why is that? because they have not fully understood it, I say. They perceive the base of nothingness as the base of nothingness. Having perceived the base of nothingness as the base of nothingness, they conceive themselves as the base of nothingness. They conceive themselves in the base of nothingness. They conceive themselves apart from the base of nothingness. They conceive the base of nothingness to be mine. They delight in the base of nothingness. And why is that? Because they have not fully understood it, I say. They perceive the base of neither perception nor non-perception as the base of neither perception nor non-perception. Having perceived the base of neither perception nor non-perception as the base of neither perception nor non-perception, they conceive of themselves as the base of neither perception nor non-perception. They conceive of themselves in the base of neither perception nor non-perception. They conceive of themselves as apart from the base of neither perception nor non-perception. They conceive the base of per neither perception nor non-perception to be mine. They delight in the base of neither perception nor non-perception. And why is that? Because they have not fully understood it, I say. They perceive the seen as the seen. Having perceived the seen as the seen, they conceive of themselves as the seen. They conceive of themselves as apart from the scene. They conceive of themselves as in the scene. They conceive of themselves, 
sorry, they conceive as the seen to be mine. They delight in the seen. And why is that? Because they have not fully understood it, I say. They perceive the herd as the herd. Having perceived the herd as the herd, they conceive of themselves as the herd. They conceive of themselves in the herd. They conceive of themselves apart from what is heard. They conceive the herd to be mine. They delight in the herd. And why is that? Because they have not fully understood it, I say. They perceive the sensed as the sensed. Having perceived the sensed as the sensed, they conceive of themselves as the sensed. Or they conceive of themselves as in the sensed. They conceive of themselves apart from the sensed. They conceive the sensed to be mine. They delight in the sensed. And why is that? Because they have not fully understood it, I say. They perceive the cognized to be the cognized. Having perceived the cognized as the cognized, they conceive of themselves as the cognized. They conceive of themselves in the cognized. They conceive of themselves apart from the cognized. They conceive the cognized to be mine. They delight in the cognized. And why is that? Because they've not fully understood it, I say. They perceive unity as unity. Having perceived unity as unity, they conceive of themselves as a unity. They conceive of themselves as apart from unity. They conceive of themselves in unity. They conceive unity to be mine. They delight in unity. And why is that? Because they have not fully understood it, I say. They perceive diversity as diversity. Having perceived diversity as diversity, they conceive of themselves as diversity. They conceive of themselves in diversity. They conceive of themselves apart from diversity. They conceive diversity to be mine. They delight in diversity. And why is that? Because they have not fully understood it, I say. <clears throat> they perceive all as all. Having perceived all as all, they conceive of themselves as all. They conceive of themselves in all. They conceive of themselves apart from all. They conceive all to be mine. They delight in all. And why is that? Because they've not fully understood it, I say. They perceive nirvana as nirvana. Having perceived nirvana as nirvana, they conceive of themselves as nirvana. They conceive of themselves as being in nirvana. They conceive themselves apart from nirvana. They conceive nirvana to be mine. They delight in nirvana. And why is that? Because they have not fully understood it, I say. Bhikkhus. Bhikkhus who are in higher training, whose minds have not yet reached the goal, and who are still aspiring to the supreme security from bondage. They directly know earth as earth. Having directly known earth as earth, they should not conceive of themselves as earth. 
They should not conceive of themselves as in earth. They should not conceive of themselves as apart from earth. They should not conceive earth to be mine. They should not delight in earth. And why is that? Because they must fully understand it, I say. And of course, then they directly know water as water. And this is where the entire series of things that I just read gets repeated. It gets repeated from the level of a bhikkhu in higher training who should not conceive of themselves as water or in water or apart from water or thinking water is mine or delighting in water and then with fire and then with air and all of them. So this is the level of the disciple in higher training who, by the way, doesn't perceive the earth element like a uneducated, untaught worldling. No, a bhikkhu or a disciple in higher training directly knows the earth element the water element. And then by directly knowing them, they know that they should not conceive of themselves as earth, so on and so on. All right, so let's pause there. Let's back all the way up to the beginning and let's sort of start kind of taking this apart. And then if we have time later on this evening, we'll kind of jump back to the way that this is structured in the latter part of the sutta. So that's the plan. So the first thing that I want to kind of mention or I want to go through is let's go through just using the earth element. Let's go through the earth element and I want to kind of focus on the fo this fourfold, I suppose it's a fivefold negation, right? So we, first of all, we have this language. And by the way, this is another one of those, uh, what I was calling a refrain or a repetition or a stock phrase. Well, one of those stock phrases or repetitions is the untaught ordinary person who has no regard for noble ones and is unskilled and undisciplined in their dharma who has no regard for true men and are unskilled and undisciplined in their dharma. That's a stock phrase. <laughs> the untaught ordinary person who basically doesn't listen to the dharma. So, you know, that's sort of, I, we don't need to talk too much about that, but I just want to point out that that's this kind of stock phrase in the world of Buddhism for your average person in that way, right? Now, what it says is, is that this ordinary untaught person that's not skilled in the Dharma, when they see earth, when they perceive earth as earth, well, let, let me remind you that in the world of Buddhism, when we're talking about the four great elements, earth, water, fire, and air, it's better to think about the earth element as that they're talking about solidity. So in other words, when the untaught ordinary person sees something solid, as something solid, <laughs> that's what they're talking about. Not being on the beach and like seeing the sand, it's about seeing something as solid, perceiving solidity. That is what they are describing in terms of an ordinary person perceiving earth as earth. It's perceiving something as solid, as solid. Now that solid, it can be this solid, or it could be something else that's solid. 
But the ordinary persons perceiving the solid, having perceived the solid, they conceive of themselves as solid. <laughs> they conceive of themselves as earth. But what they're talking about is like as something solid. Or they conceive of themselves as like in the solid. And so this is that idea of like, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. You could either think that you are your solid body arm, or you somehow think you are in the solid body. So those are two slightly different ideas. It's the idea that I am the solid physical body or that I'm in there somewhere. Or, and now this is going to be a really interesting one for our conversation tonight. The third of these is that the untaught ordinary person conceives of themselves as apart from the solid. So if we're talking about the solidness of my body, one option is that I think I'm not, I'm apart from the solid. Or insofar as my teacup here is solid, I do not think that I am it. So that is an ordinary uneducated person thinking that they are apart from the solid. The Then the last one, or I should say the second to last one, the untaught educated person, uneducated person, conceives the solid to be mine. In other words, insofar as my arm is solid, it's made of the earth element predominantly, I think it's my arm. So I either think I am the physical body, I'm in the physical body, I'm not the physical body, or the physical body's mine. <laughs> but those, of course, are all wrong. Those are not, that's what an untaught ordinary person thinks. Oh, and of course, number five, the untaught ordinary person delights in the solid in the earth element in that way. Now, that's the fourfold looking for the self here in solidity, in something solid in that way. Any questions about anything so far, but in particular, this sort of first idea or this first set of ideas that we've been talking about? This fourfold negation or fivefold negation. Everybody doing okay with all this? Cool. That nice, nice group here. So I just want to make sure everybody's with us. Great to see you all. Okay. So then we're talking about earth element, but again, we're talking about the solid. And then we move to the second element, which is the liquid, same idea, but it's about the untaught ordinary person thinking that they are sort of the liquid or that they're in the liquid or that they're apart from the liquid or that the liquid is theirs. And by the way, that would be like my saliva my tears, my liquid aspects of the body. So that would that would be how to think of that. And then of course, the untaught person delights in water. <laughs> the fire element, let's remember that fire is sort of about temperature, right? It's not necessarily about a fire, it's about heat. But I would also then want to kind of like, I haven't really mentioned this when we've been talking about the elements, but 
it's kind of nice to know or it's mm, you know it's a good thing to know within the world of like not just buddhism but in the world of like indian yoga meditation philosophy the heat element the fire element it's also kind of very associated with what we would call maybe like energy that could be sexual energy but it could also just be any kind of energy is an aspect of like well energy sexual energy is very related to the fire element in that way that if you've got a lot of fire element you might be very stimulated in that sense so now what we're talking about then is that stimulation that energy that excitement that heat element and the untaught person thinks they are that energy that heat element or that they're somehow in it or that they are apart from it or that the the energy is theirs like i you know we even talk this way i'm low energy today I've got a lot of energy today. My temperature is 98.6 degrees. It, notice the way we own or can own and claim ownership over the fire element. And then, of course, insofar as the fire element could be associated with something like, say, sexual energy, we delight in the fire element in that way. And then there's the wind element. The wind element again is about movement in that sense. It's the most subtle of the four elements. In many ways, you know, wind isn't a thing. It's movement and then things that are either solid, liquid or fire in that way those things move and their movement is the wind element once again the untaught ordinary person thinks that they are their movement or that they are somehow in the movement of their body or that they are apart from that movement or that the movement is mine look at me moving my arms I'm, it's my wind element. I'm moving them. Well, at least that's what the untaught ordinary person thinks because they haven't fully understood the air element in that way. Okay, so those are the four elements and how it is that the untaught ordinary person mistakenly conceives of them as the self. Anybody see any holes there? Anybody see any problems with that? Are we feeling straightforward with that just want to remind everybody again it's not that the self is somewhere else <laughs> and that like later on the buddha is going to tell us where the self really is <laughs> no no it's just going to be negations in that way because the general teaching is that there is no self so those are the four elements then we get to after the elements, the first thing that we are introduced to is something called a bahuta. So Bhikkhu Bodhi here translates this bahuta as a being. And I would just want to know, or I would want you to know, because I know there's a lot of Dharma heads out there. We have one word, which is a sattva, right? Like a bodhisattva. And the word sattva, sattva, it is also translated as a being. But a sattva is normally a sentient being. It's kind of built into the sat part of the sattva, is a kind of sentient being. Whereas this word bh long U, T, long A, bahuta. Well, it's related to the word, ultimately, I guess it's related to baha. And it's like about an idea of like, 
Baha is sort of about a becoming, as they say, or this kind of like a something coming into existence. So something that has Bahad in that sense, that something that has like arisen is a Bahuta. And so I think actually the translation of it, of it as a being is a, you know, that's, that's a, it sounds good to me as far as my etymological research is gone. So we're talking about any kind of being. And what I'm getting at is, is that like, this is like the most, the word bahuta, as far, as far as I could tell, is like the most basic type of being of which it you it might be a sattva, <laughs> like a sattva is a type of bahuta. So all sattvas are bahutas, but not all bahutas are sattvas, if you will. My point is, is that this is a very general category of beings. And so having perceived beings as beings, the untaught common person conceives, basically conceives of themselves as a being or conceives of themselves as in a being or perceives themselves as apart from beings <clears throat> or perceives the being to be mine. Delighting in beings in that way. So what we've done here is, of course, we've started with the building blocks of reality, the four elements. And then we've gone one by one saying, yep, nope, not earth, not water, not fire, not air. Well, what about some fancy combination of earth, water, fire, and air into the state of a being? How about that, Buddha? Am I a being? And of course, the teaching is, no, not in a being, not as a being, not apart from beings. The being is not mine in that way. But the common uneducated person thinks it is. Now that we've dealt with any kind of being, we move to specific types of beings, starting with a deva. So this is what, you know, again, is normally just translated as a god. I'm not going to do a lot of talking about the word deva and its relationship to English words like divine, because I've already talked about that in Darmendor's past, but let it be known that all the English words revolving around like divinity and the divine, anything in that family of a D and a V is going to be coming from this deva word, this Sanskrit um, Pali word. And of course, the devas are the, the most, it's a broad general category of what do what would you call them <laughs> you would call them gods i suppose but the idea is that gods are a category of non-human beings i guess that would be a way of saying it and so the common untaught person basically perceives themselves as a god or in the gods or apart from the gods or they conceive gods to be mine delighting in gods, right? Questions about what that means? No, pretty straightforward. Oh, Noe, question, idea. Uh, the word, the word spirit comes hmm. to mind. Mm -hmm. It's not that a person, a yeah. spirit. Not my spirit. It's it's the spirit. Yeah. yeah. Essence, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, spirit. A spirit's a tricky word, probably just as tricky as God in that sense. Um yeah, I would I would I would want you to know though that when they're talking about devas, when they're talking about gods, 
these are, you know, um, personalities. <clears throat> like they have characteristics, names, backstories, and all of that. Yeah. So. All right. <clears throat> now, we're, what we're doing is we're doing the building blocks of any being, which are the four elements, then beings in general, gods in general, and now we're going to start getting into specific gods. So the first of these specific gods is, uh, in Sanskrit, it's Prajapati. In Pali, it's Pajapati. And this is a very tricky name, a very tricky god. And I say that because it's the name of a god in a lot of different Indian traditions. And my point is, is that in some Indian traditions, Pajapati is like a consort, a female consort god of other gods. But in other traditions, Pajapati is a name for Indra. But then in other traditions, Pajapati is a name for Brahma because Pajapati has the, the name Pajapati is related to creation. And so Pajapati seems maybe like a creator god. And so there's an association with Brahma because Brahma's a creator god. The problem with that is that Brahma's next. So it can't be Brahma. If you read Bhikkhu Bodhi's footnotes, he suggests that it could either be interpreted as Indra or Mara. And of course, those two beings couldn't really be any more opposite from each other. So that doesn't really help us in terms of like triangulating anything here. We're not getting any closer. My feeling, my personal feeling is that if you look at the if you look at the way this goes and what i mean is let's just i'm going to zoom out really quickly right now we're talking about pajapati and we're trying to figure out who or what that might be but next is brahma and then after that are these gods of streaming radiance and then the gods of refulgent glory, and then the gods of great fruit. I want to tell you a little bit about those, and it might help us figure out who Pajapati is in a way. So, in other words, really quickly, we're going to skip Pajapati. We're going to come back to Pajapati in a second. Brahma, as I just mentioned, Brahma is the name of traditionally of the creator God. And what they mean by that is, is that Brahma is considered the first God that is <laughs> the first God that comes into existence. You know, language starts to break down here when we are talking about like creation itself. I don't know what verb to actually use when we're talking about the creation itself, but the idea is, is that Brahma is coextensive with the four elements. Like if there's four elements ever, Brahma is there working with them. And that's why Brahma is the creator God because Brahma like works with earth, water, fire, and air, and kind of fabricates the physical world. But what we kind of need to remember, or if you don't know this already, you, you need to know it. The In Buddhism, the meditative states that, that are known as jhanas or dhyanas in Sanskrit, those meditative realms or meditative zones 
first of all, are all those four jhanas of, you know, there's these four dhyanas or jhanas, they are in the realm of form, meaning the realm of the four great elements, which is Brahma's realm. And that's why the four Bra the four dhyanas are also sometimes referred to as the four Brahma viharas, abodes of Brahma. Because that's you, when you are meditating, you're moving into the realm of Brahma. In this schematic of this sutra, when they introduce Brahma as Brahma, it's kind of code for the first jhana. And then the gods of streaming radiance, that realm is equivalent to the second jhana. And then the realm of the gods of refulgent glory are, they hang out in the third jhana. And then the gods of great fruit are the gods that are hanging out in the realm of the fourth jhana. So in other words, we're sort of getting more and more transcendent as we go from the realm of Brahma to the realm of the uh, streaming radiance gods, to the realm of the refulgent glory gods, to the great fruit gods. And then we're going to go to the overlord. So in other words, we're going kind of, if we're going, if we're going to use the vertical metaphor, by which I mean that somehow like moving upwards is better, or something, then you'll notice that we've been moving upwards and then up to the overlord. So what that would mean to me reading this is that if we back back down, back to Brahma, whoever this Pajapati person is, they're kind of below Brahma. And that would, for me, indicate Indra. So if you were to ask me after all of this kind of detective work, my feeling is, is that this sutra is using Pajapati as a, uh, as a way of referencing Indra, which is again, a, a lesser, Indra is considered a lesser God to Brahma, the creator God. So Tanya, question or idea? Yeah, hey, so did you say that the four jhanas correlate with the four Brahma Viharas? Mm, I did say that. And this is a point of, um, it's not a point of controversy, but it's a definitely a point of unclarity. And what that is, is, is that you may have all heard of the four Brahma Viharas, the four <laughs> realms of Brahma. And those four Brahma Viharas are usually associated with what are called the four immeasurable states of mind. Infinite loving kindness, infinite compassion, infinite empathic joy, and infinite equanimity or upeksha. So in other words, like loving kindness gets you into the first Brahma Vihara. And then compassion gets you into the second and so on. And there's a question about what's the relationship between the first Brahma Vihara that you get into because of loving kindness and the first Jhana. As far as I understand it, they are the same, the same. Now that puts me in a camp or that puts me in a certain, as a certain type of Buddhist teacher, because I know that not all teachers teach it that way. Some teachers teach that the Brahma Viharas are their own thing. And then there's the yeah. dhyanas. The only reason why I think that they are synonymous is because everything in terms of jhana, as I said, is happening in the realm of Brahma. That's the whole idea. And the idea of, a, of like loving kindness and compassion as tickets to dhyana or tickets to the Brahma Viharas we need to kind of keep in mind 
Indra, the god I just mentioned, is the god of the realm of desire. Gimme, gimme, gimme. Get away from me. Get away from me. Anger, aversion. That's the realm of desire, the kamadatu. How could I get out of that? How could I transcend the realm of desire? Well, if I'm stuck in the realm of desire because of gimme, 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 and get away from me, well, then I bet I could get out of that by being generous and lovingly kind and compassionate. <laughs> and then that would break the connection with the realm of desire. And that's my ticket to the realm of form and the realm of Brahma. So yes, Tanya, I did equate the four Brahma Viharas with the four Jhanas. And again, that's not always done, but. Yeah, thanks so much. Cause yeah, I've heard, I, I definitely have a teacher now thinking that they might not agree, but again, it's just everybody has their, but I wanted to hear what you had to say about it. So thanks so much. Yep. Yep. And again, I'm totally aware that people teach this differently and in good Buddhism, there's no right or wrong. So <laughs> now in that sense, <laughs> so any other questions now that we've, oh yeah, Noe and then Maria. Yes. <laughs> um, thank you. Uh, what was the question? <laughs> Did this 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 jhanas and this idea of levels and this idea of accomplishments? This is all before the Buddha. It was all taught before he studied this stuff, and here we are examining it. So I, I, you know, I'm coming back to my simple, a simple understanding, um, because they too are, are are desires and clinging and and and, and cravings and and something to do. So is he talking about this because of the religions of the time? Yes, uh, and the foundation of that. Okay, okay. Yep. Thank you. And Noe, I'm glad you mentioned that. Let me. I want to add something really quickly. So Noe mentions that kind of all of this was already understood before the time of the Buddha. And yes, the cosmology that's being presented here in terms of the four great elements, levels of gods, Brahma, Indra, that's all before the Buddha. That's the cosmological milieu that the Buddha was born into. Famously, by the way, and I do want to mention this just because it's totally responds to Noe's question. So after the gods, after Brahma, and then the gods of the second jhana, and the gods of the third jhana, and then the great fruit gods of the fourth jhana, we come to the overlord. I have things to say about the overlord, but also was already pre-Buddhist in that way. And then we're going to come to the base of infinite space, which is a kind of a meditative state. Then the base of infinite consciousness, the base of infinite nothingness, and then the base of neither perception nor non-perception. Also important to know that when the Buddha, this is the story when the Buddha left the palace and went off into the woods for six years to practice austerities and all of that, he famously studied under two major teachers, somebody named Alara Kalama and somebody named Ramaputra. Alara Kalama, and, and again, this I'm just reporting the story, Alara Kalama supposedly taught how you can access infinite nothingness. And that for Alara Kalama, the Buddha's first teacher in that way, the inf a, a meditative state of infinite nothingness was considered the ultimate state of liberation, according to Alara Kalama. The Buddha under Alara Kalama achieved the state of infinite nothingness but basically did not think that that was actual liberation, that that was sort of like turning the volume down, but not liberation. 
And so he left Alara Kalama and he went to study with Ramaputra. Ramaputra, well, what that name means is actually Putra of Rama, child of Rama. Rama was this Ramaputra guy's father. Rama supposedly taught how to achieve the base of neither perception nor non-perception. His son, Ramaputra, continued to teach the methods for achieving the state of neither perception nor non-perception, but Ramaputra himself supposedly couldn't get into the state of neither perception or non-perception like his father. So he was teaching what his father taught, but he supposedly couldn't accomplish it. The Buddha or Siddhartha comes to study with Ramaputra, Rama's son, and achieves the state of neither perception nor non-perception. At which point Ramaputra literally says, I should be your student then because you have done what I wasn't able to do. And the Buddha basically is like, but I don't, I'm not going to teach the state of neither perception nor non-perception. He's like, that's not liberation either. And so that's when the Buddha decides to go alone and realizes what the Buddha realized, which is basically what we are talking about in that way. So indeed, Noe, everything in this, yes, everything in this is from before the Buddha. And thus we want to pay very close attention to, well, then what's Buddhist about this? It is this denial that the self is the four elements, is a being, is a god, is Pajapati, is Brahma, or is like... And by the way, I did want to mention the idea of conceiving of oneself as Brahma or being in Brahma. This is a big part of many Indian religious traditions is to come to an understanding that you either are Brahma or that you are sort of in Brahma, like a swimming pool or like a fishbowl, like you are in Brahma. <laughs> the Buddha by saying, no, 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 that only somebody who doesn't really understand it would say that. That is kind of a, you know, going directly against a lot of like common Indian religious practice in that way. So, okay. Once again, and I just want to go through these quickly. Each of those dhyanas or jhanas, beginning with the realm of Brahma, they are understood to be inhabited by these gods. And in the first jhana, you meet Brahma and Brahma's attendants. Uh, Brahma is considered to be like a, a manager. <laughs> and he has a lot of underlings that do like the, 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 the dirty work, so to speak. And so in the first level of jhana, you sort of are encountering Brahma and Brahma's attendants. And then in the second, you may encounter these gods of streaming radiance. <laughs> and then in the third jhana, you might encounter these gods of refulgent glory. And then in the fourth jhana, the gods of the great fruit in that way. By the way, it's always important to remember that in Buddhism, spiritual accomplishments are considered fruits of like that's the language or the metaphor that buddhism is plays with is the idea of like when when something comes to, i guess in english we use that phrase for something to come to fruition well the, the buddhist use that idea of fruition a lot and so the idea of the gods of great fruit it's because it's in the fourth jhana that great fruit happens. Great fruition happens in the fourth jhana. But of course, 
you might be led at any one of those levels to be led to believe that you are a god of refulgent glory or and maybe i want to start mentioning this or if you happen to get into the third jhana you might think that you are encountering gods of refulgent glory and now let's just pause there and do a like a little dharma in that way we're doing a lot a lot of cosmology let's do a little dharma so what we're talking about this whole sutra and again what we've been talking about now for a long time many months we're talking about this idea of no self anatta right and so what we want to be kind of thinking of is either identity by which i mean i am blank i am this body i am my thoughts i am my emotions i am what you know fill in the blank but so that's what i mean by identity I am, or there's the, I am not, I'm not that, I am not you, I'm not that computer, I'm not the ceiling, I'm not the floor, I'm not. So now what we want to do is, is we want to start noticing where this sense of self is arising from. And what we want to notice is that the sense of self is arising from both of those, identifying as and not identifying as. And so whether you are thinking in terms of I am my body or I am my emotions or I am my thoughts, or you're thinking that I'm not that, we want to notice that self that's there, <laughs> thinking that way and noticing, and this is what I've said in many Dharma doors past, the basic idea here is noticing that, well, first of all, we want to kind of have a tacit understanding that the self, this idea of me, so we want to have a tacit understanding that that idea of me is an illusion, a kind of a fabrication. But then where is that me idea coming from? And we want to notice that it's coming from a kind of tension. And it's a tension that is arising from a kind of tension of not being that. And so if there's a sense of not, that's creating a sense of is. Or it goes the other way too. Notice that as soon as there's a me, there is the arising of what is now not me. It's like a package deal. As soon as I'm saying that this is me, I create the category, not me. Or as soon as I establish the category, not me, I have created the idea of what, of me. And again, we, from a Buddhist idea, Buddhist position, we want to see the dependent arising of these things. As soon as there's other, ooh, self, or as soon as self, other. And that's what they're talking about with this language of the untaught person thinks of themselves as or as apart from, or as in, or as having in that way. And then just, we now are going through all the various possible stations of rebirth, even through the gods. No, you have a question, idea? Um, yeah, it's kind of related to what you were just saying, and that is that, you know, sometimes these sutras that go on and on and on and on, you're like, oh, I get it. I get it. Right. But 
I, I so appreciated listening to this today because just on that very point of which things which things am I more likely to identify as or not identify as? It varied. I mean, you know, earth versus Brahma, but even earth versus water versus wind versus fire, like how much that was like, oh, I don't do that. Or yeah, yeah, I do that. <laughs> you know, it's mm -hmm. so uh, it's very skillful. <laughs> Excellent. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Maria, did you have a question from a while ago? Sorry about that. Oh. Um, yeah, so a couple of things were interesting to me. This idea that uh, we and the gods are operating from inside the great perfection that all the rest of every thing else in phenomenological reality. Uh, Maria, I'm sorry, I don't I don't think I'm alone in not being able to hear you. Sorry about that. Hmm? How's that? No. Can you hear me now? It's a little better. I can. Really? I can kind of hear now. I could probably repeat your question. Sounds like you're under a underwater or, or under a yeah. pillow or something. Like we, right yeah. Okay, try this. <laughs> How's that? Huh? Can you hear me now? Better. Sure. Yeah. How's that? We can do okay. it. Okay. Um, I don't know what's going on, but um, I'm just trying to say that um, there's a couple of interesting things going on here um, that the gods are operating inside of you know, the great perfection or inside of phenomenological reality, just like everything else. Um, and also that, you know, we're not them, they're not, I mean, that they're just empty, just like everything else. So, you know, there's this um, conventional aspect as well as the um, ultimate aspect that's being sort of um, tacitly addressed here throughout the, the sutra, and then when, especially when we bring in the gods. So, mm -hmm. that does apply, I do. so awesome point, Maria, because I did want to mention, and I, oh uh, yeah, so it was sort of not so much, uh, I'm going to, Tanya, I'm going to repeat your, it wasn't so much a question so, so much as a comment, uh, Maria, or that's what I heard was a, a comment more. And it was about how the, as we go through all of these gods, that even though we're at these really like rarefied high levels of the gods, they're still participating in the same phenomena, phenomenological reality as every, as the dirt, as the water, as everything else in that way. That is a big part of the Buddhist message is that heaven is just different <laughs> better worse no but different in that way but maria i want to use your comment to bring it all the way back to a really important thing so i said at the very opening of tonight's session that in the last few sutras that we were dealing with last year we noticed this thing, or I made a point to highlight this thing about the gods coming to the Buddha with questions. And like, well, what does the Buddha know that these gods don't know? Well, what is so interesting about Buddhism is that even the gods are suffering from self-identity. Even Brahma deludedly thinks he's Brahma. And that's what makes the Buddha superior or what have you to all the gods, is that the Buddha no longer has that clinging to self-identity, whereas even the gods do. 
And that's a really kind of powerful message, I think, about like, well, I guess it's a very powerful message about what would be called moksha, uh, liberation, in that sense, which is that, and, and it's why the Buddhists talk about the unique, the very unique experience of being a human, all beings, all bahuta, all beings are suffering from the delusion of self. And it's if from microscopic, actually even from kind of microscopic organisms that have a sense of, any sense of self-preservation are suffering from delusion of self and it goes all the way up to the gods. So from single-celled amoeba all the way to the gods, all is suffering from that delusion of self-identity. And Buddhism talks about the unique position of a human being, which is the ability to actually stop doing that. And actually, as soon as you get up into the heavenly realms or you get down into the lower realms, it gets really hard to realize no self, apparently, for a variety of reasons. Up in heaven, it's kind of actually too good. The party's too good to realize no self. And in the lower realms, it's actually, it sucks so hard that you're just kind of suffering from it so hard that you can't realize no self. It's the sweet kind of sweet spot of a human being that suffers but has pleasure and can realize this teaching of no self. So in incredibly liberating in that way. And by the way, I would want to point this out. Incredibly, um, what's the word? Incredibly open. And what I mean by that is there is no barriers to anybody realizing no self. And what, what, what I mean by that, of course, is that men are not quicker to realize no self than women. Children are not less quick to realize no self than adults. Nobody is. It's, it's sort of an, a very equal possibility for everybody in that way. And it's something that I find very refreshing in that way about Buddhism, that its message is so clear in terms of this teaching of no self. But can you realize it? Well, maybe, maybe, maybe tonight, maybe next week, we'll find out. So, all right, everybody, let's pause there. Because we didn't get to like the other parts of it, I think we will continue this sutta next week and do the Arhat Tathagata and how they work with all of this. So yeah, so stay tuned for more of that next week. Oh, I did mention at the very beginning that I had a few classes coming up and Noam, if you don't mind me taking a moment. So really quickly, um, thank you Noam for putting that. Um, so as everybody knows, I have my own little project, the Lotus Underground, and through Lotus Underground, I offer my own classes. So this month, um, on Thursday night, starting, I think it's the 25th, I'm going to do a six-week night class that's going to be on Thursday nights from 7 to 8.30 p.m., and it's six weeks on the idea of the ground of being and it's going to be using Vasu Bandhu, who's a Buddhist philosopher from the 4th, 5th century. Uh, Vasu Bandhu's little poem on the three natures. So that's going to be kind of basically a six-week Yogacara class on the teaching of the ground of being and the three natures. And then on February, I think it's 10th. Sorry, February. Yeah, on Saturday, February 10th, which is Lunar New Year, on Saturday morning, I'm going to do a kind of a long, probably two, three hour talk on Buddhist ideas of time, kind of uh, uh, 
kind of a topic I've been wanting to talk about for a while. I have like a ton of notes of all these different ideas of Buddhism and time. And so I'm finally putting them all together into like a long presentation on that topic. So those are two things that are going to come up in January and February. And so if you're interested, you can go to lotusunderground.com and find out more. Otherwise, I'll be back here next week to continue the root of all things sutta. So. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate Thanks so much. much. Thank my, you, Michael. My Thank great you, no. pleasure. Thanks, so glad no. to be back. Thank you. I'm happy, happy to be here. Missed you. <laughs> I missed everybody. Hmm?